This all started with a free oven and I really wanted to make one so I was waiting for a free oven to come along and I got one with a broken glass cooktop. It was only like five miles away and I snagged it as soon as I could. This whole build took me approximately two weeks. I wasn't working on it the entire time obviously but if you're going to try to do this yourself, I would rate this as complicated as maybe 8 or 9 out of 10. Um, you're going to have to learn how to weld. If you don't know how to do that, you're kind of screwed. Uh, you have to be able to cut metal. Uh, you have to know some things about electricity. But all in all, it was worth it. So I took the oven apart, you know, and noting and labeling what wires came from what. Um, it kind of really sucked taking it apart. It was a lot of little screws and trying to figure out how to get to them. But just make sure you, you label things and you save everything. All ovens are basically just one box within a box with the inner box holding the things you're trying to heat up with the layer of insulation between the two. That's really all I'm trying to do. I picked up five sheets of 2x4 16 gauge steel. Every box has six sides, so I cut that one in half to make the top and bottom, creating the six pieces that I needed. Building a box really isn't all that complicated. The hard part is making it all square, and a big sheet of metal, the only thing it really wants to do is lay flat on the ground. Uh, so you have to find ways to hold it in place long enough so you can tack each side together. I tacked all the corners together to create the box first and then I went around and welded it so it was stronger. We obviously can't make this thing out of plywood or wood. That would be a very bad idea for an oven. So we have to deal with metal, things that don't burn and that are strong. So how do we join these pieces together? I chose welding for this instead of fasteners, largely because one, I can, and two, because it's so much easier. If you're someone out there who doesn't know how to weld, you should really learn. Don't even think about building a box for powder coating. Just go out and buy a welder and crappy metal and just try welding. Even really crappy welds, ones that look really terrible, they're actually really pretty strong. And this box is not something that really needs to be exceptionally strong. No one's going to die if this thing is not welded perfectly. I would say that I do 90% of my welding in TIG welding, but for this the metal is so dirty and it takes so long to clean it up and then I have it, uh, my left hand free to hold something with arc welding, whereas I can't with TIG welding because the left one's holding filter rod. So I'm using 7018 welding rod which is fine but it's a total pain in the dick to use a welding rod more than once so if you light off a little tack and then you want to go start another weld somewhere there's a little slag layer that builds at the end of your your electrode and you got to knock that off which is why you'll see me tapping it a bunch of times to get the arc started I would use different rod but this is what I had laying around and I don't do enough of it to really justify going buying something else so I just used it I'm using angle iron to reinforce the sides of the box and any box needs to have square sides. So each side needs to be the same length as the other side opposing it. So marking it out like I just did, that's a real help. I'm now using angle iron for the external box. I'm just making the frame and tacking it to the inner box right now. And you thought you would never use this again. It comes in handy all the time, math. I just love math. But I need to put this external frame, that bracket that you just saw me holding, some distance away so that I can weld it and it ends up being square. The problem is I don't know how long of a leg to come off of. And I can't measure that because it doesn't exist. Uh, there's no, I can't just measure into empty space. So I need to figure out a way to calculate the length that I need here, which I just did, which is the hypotenuse. You can see those little 2.65 inch long flat stocks I welded at a 45 degree angle. That's why I have a compass out there. I'm using those to hold up this, this frame so I can weld the ends to it and then I can check for squareness otherwise. Those little legs really helped 
to support the work because I'm just working by myself. And it allows me to make all these adjustments for checking for squares such as this without it being too much of a hassle. What I'm doing here while I'm squaring it up is just adding tacks in as many places that I can. Uh, this helps hold it in its shape so that you can do your final welding because when you do your final welding, it gets really hot and the weld is much bigger. And when it contracts and gets cold, it'll change the shape of your box. So you gotta pay attention to that. Now I'm basically doing the same process as I did on the bottom, except I didn't need to make those 2.65 inch long little legs because I had the uprights to go from the bottom up to the top. And that was calculated based just on simple subtraction. I knew it was 52 inches tall, uh, one inch angle iron times two. I had to make it 50 inches long for the uprights. And I'm just using those little bits of angle iron plus those weights to help hold it in place as well until I get those uprights in place. Once I get all these little tacks done and the top and the bottom put on, I'm going to put these uprights in place. I'm going to tack them for now. And then once everything is sort of together, all tacked together, I'm going to go around the entire box and just weld every little bit. I switched to two inch angle iron for the door. It just needed to be that size because of the two inch insulation. The two inch angle iron door at this point is just tacked together. And then I clamped it to the box that is already solidly welded. This way that the frame of the door is going to be as close as possible to the exact shape of the opening while I do the final welding here. The nice thing about using a donor oven is that it has everything that I would have wanted, except I don't have to make it, which is really great. So right now I'm just opening up the door so I could put the original oven window in. The original oven was wider than it was taller. So what I did for mine, which is taller than it is wider, is just turn the window 90 degrees. It's pretty easy to underestimate the amount of damage that a cutoff wheel can cause to your hands or your eyes. So what I did is intentionally left it partially cut out and then just finished it off with this hacksaw because that door could fall in, crimp the blade, and then cause damage by either the wheel breaking or getting it caught and then into my hands, right through a glove. It's happened before. They're very dangerous. What I'm doing now is just cutting out the excess from the pre-existing window holding hardware. It already existed, so I might as well use it. One of the things I like least about metalworking is cutting metal in a, a long line in a straight line it's really tough you got to use like a grinder with a cutoff wheel they're very dangerous i've cut myself needing stitches cut a tendon uh, i generally avoid them as much as possible they can bite really hard so i'm using a tin steps here plus grinders shoot off sparks and it goes everywhere every little bit of metal flies all over your garage leaving a little black dust on everything one of the best things I ever bought, even though it doesn't help me with this problem, is a horizontal bandsaw for just making miter cuts. And now what I'm going to do is just drill some holes so that I can mount this lower plate to the door. It's going to require more than just one hole, but I'm not going to film them all because it's not very interesting. Now I need to fabricate some brackets to hold the casters. I already have part of it, but I need the other two sides for the casters. And what I'm doing here, I cut them all out of my bandsaw, and now I'm tacking them, and then I'm just gonna weld them up. You may notice that my TIG torch is a little odd, and that's because, well, I'm a little odd, and then also I made it on my metal lathe. I always wanted a, a torch that was more like what you're used to, what you've been using your entire life, like a pencil. And if you're interested in that, that is one of my previous videos, you can go back and watch that whole video. And you can also subscribe if you find these sort of things interesting. I would really appreciate it. The fan on my welder is quite loud, so that's just part of this. So you'll hear that. You hear the gas escaping once I press the pedal. Uh, I always think that thing's kind of fun. If you're interested in what kind of welder I'm using, it is a Prime Weld uh, TIG 225X, I think. Uh, People brag it up. It's a pretty good welder and it's only like $700. It'll do AC aluminum. Um, it'll do 
DC obviously and then uh, you do arc welding with it it's a pretty good all-in-one machine only thing I can't do is uh, MIG welding MIG welding definitely has its place it's a very easy I would say I think a lot of people a lot of the more experienced TIG welders kind of poo-poo it uh, but it definitely has its place it's great for a whole lot of quick fabrication um, but I personally don't have a lot of use for it because I don't do that sort of thing plus you still need a gas bottle like TIG so it's kind of got a big little bit of a barrier for entry but um, when I need to do stuff like that I just set it to, to stick mode and I just do arc welding I did have a nice Miller welder before this but it was DC only which meant I couldn't do any aluminum and then this one has pulse um, I thought it might be a really neat thing to try but the more I used it the less I actually did use it I found out it didn't really help much um, it's probably good for like overhead welding where you need to cool off your puddle a little bit more so it doesn't fall down into your your tungsten but I don't really experience any worse welding results with this machine versus my nice wel Miller welder now you can see why I only needed the two sides for this bracket because the frame acts as the other two sides. I really just needed to have something to mount that fourth hole, that fourth bolt, into this thing plus add a little support from the bottom for the other two sides. You may notice that my filler rod is a little odd colored. That's because it's stainless. Uh, I don't have any uh, ER70S uh, the copper colored there the steel ones are copper colored that's how I can tell um, but it means that uh, I'm the temperature for steel is a little bit hotter and I'm using this I don't get as nice a looking welds but really I don't care um, mostly I just want some really hot flat welds so that I don't have to grind as much off so when I put these casters on they lay flat time to mount these casters I've already done three I'm glad you're done with this so anytime you got to drill holes to line something that is already drilled, this is the way I like to do it. So I'm just going to sort of, this is just a sharpened tungsten for TIG welding. I like it for scratching. They make scratch holes, but they get kind of dull and brittle and they break. These already have a lot of. All right, so I, I scratch that out and thankfully I don't have to really focus that much on where these things are going to sit. It doesn't require a high level of precision here. So I'm just going to start this one hole off. Just get a divot. Doesn't have to be perfect. You can use a smaller drill bit if you want to do a better job of it. All right. So I'm going to use a quarter inch here. This is my handy dandy oil, somewhat spill proof oil container here. When you're drilling through steel, it's kind of nice to have a little lube. It cuts faster and it's easier on your equipment. I'm going to be tapping these because this whole inside part is all going to be closed off and I can't really get, I mean, I can, as long as I don't care if I put them all together, then insulate and close everything off. It's fine. But what if a bolt comes loose? You know, how are you going to reach in to grab a nut? You got to take the whole thing apart. So I'd rather th just thread it. And because this is the bottom, obviously, so the weight of this thing, I don't know, it's like 150 to 200 pounds is going to be pressing these casters directly into this. It doesn't really need to be all that great. So I'm just keeping the wheels from going sideways, just holding it in place, basically. So I have a 3 8 16 or 3 8 16th 
the bolts that I'm going to be using. That 16 just refers to the pitch of the threads. It's one sixteenth of an inch wide between threads, or they're 16 and an inch. And the diameter is 3 eighths. This happens to be the tap drill, which is thankfully is just normal size. I have all the number tap drills and stuff, but it's nice when it's just 5 sixteenths. That's pretty easy. All right, so I would have liked to have chosen a less coarse thread, but when you go to the hardware store and you get a big bag of bolts for cheap, they usually only offer coarse. I don't know why. 3 is 24 would have been better. That would have been a little easier because the greater the pitch, the distance between the threads, the deeper the thread is, and it just makes it harder to cut, harder to start. I'm not too particularly concerned about how straight this is going in. It's only an eighth of an inch thick. I'll get two, two full threads out of it. There are going to be four bolts holding in each caster. So the total force is this going to be had on it is not that great. Plus it's held in four, so each one is divisible by four. You don't have to have the craziest threading job in the planet. And you can see right here, I intentionally did not weld or right here because it makes it very difficult to drill or tap anything in those spots. It changes the properties of the metal to where they're really hard. I mean, you can, it's just you wear your stuff out more quickly quickly it's just a pain in the ass all right it's not in there super straight but i don't care all right it's hard but it's only an eighth inch thick you don't really have the hole to guide you you know in straight but also it does not matter all right so put this on I get the wheel out of the shot here. I'm going with these big, uh, I guess the pneumatic tires because I'm gonna be pushing out of my garage and onto the driveway and there's a lot of bumps and stuff and you got wheels and you know, something fragile in here. You don't want it. Plus it's really tall, it's very top heavy. So you don't want to be pushing it and then having the whole thing tip over on you and the big wheels just make it uh, a little cushier and then rolls over cracks a little easier it's like when you're skateboarding you know and you hit that little rock it sends you flying just trying to avoid that it doesn't happen on a bike because they're much bigger and they're rubber all right so i'm using this one hole basically as a clamp you could just use clamps to hold this whole thing in place I don't need it to be that accurate as where the holes are, plus these are slotted, and then also the holes for the casters are bigger than the bolts I'm using, so I got a lot of wiggle room. It's also gonna be a spot I'm not gonna look at underneath. So it's not gonna bother my ego any if it's not perfect, and I notice it every day. All right, got that squared away. Now what I like to do is use a drill bit just larger than, or a little bit smaller than the hole itself. I'm not drilling all the way through. This is much too big for my tap anyways. But I go in here and I just put a little divot where the hole needs to go and then I use a smaller drill bit, just a good way of aligning it so I know where it needs to go, approximately. There we 
can see there's a pretty good divot there. I gotta turn this wheel, otherwise it hits the wheel. Okay, like that. Dang it. Would have liked to take taken these casters apart, but it doesn't really seem to be a nut for the, that holds the, uh, the wheel assembly to the plate. All right, so each one have a divot. Now I get to remove them all, remove this bolt. Sorry for the shakiness. This thing's pretty tall and my tripod isn't tall enough. So now the tripod is on top of the piece I'm working on. So anytime this thing shakes, camera shakes. So, I'm gonna swap over to my quarter inch drill bit here. You see they're all fairly well located right now. Make sure this thing's pretty tight. Grab some oil. All right, and then I'm just gonna repeat that uh, with 5 sixteenths here, quarter to quarter, 5 sixteenths, 5 sixteenths. We're gonna tap through it. There you go. You got your mounting points. All right, if I sound funny, that's because I have a uh, respirator on and some hearing protection and some goggles on. This is a sort of buffing pad. I want to get the zinc off because I think I'm probably going to take this oven up to temps that zinc is not going to last. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get it all off to bare metal and then uh, Use some 2000 degree paint on it, but I need to get this off first.
It's time to put some hinges on. These are some well done hinges. This direction is down. I have the whole thing laying on its side on the ground right now. And you want to make sure that you put, especially for these, that this is down, the door is going to press down against there. And you want the other one to match, otherwise you won't get the door off. This way I can get the door off by lifting it up and off. So what I'm going to do is uh, be very careful. I want both hinges to be aligned. Uh, let's say it was like this. The door is going to open at a weird angle, sort of upwards. So the other hinge would have to match that. It wouldn't be possible. But So they have to be parallel on all planes. Otherwise, the door isn't going to open appropriately. But uh, I'm going to start by tacking these off. And uh, the door should be good after that. There's a little bit of wiggle room in these hinges to account for some variance. But uh, you can't just throw hinges on without... Uh, paying attention to how they, they work. So the door is on. I had to have this in place before mounting the door. It's held loosely. Inside here, there's a 3 16 inch uh, wire frame that I just bent around. And then I welded the two terminals to the actual oven itself. If I have to replace this thing, then I can uh, just uh, grind those off and then Reweld them back on. So I got some of this uh, easy spread fiberglass stove gasket cement. So see how well it works. I'm not particularly sure. Yeah, there's a lot of air in there. Hopefully this is enough. Let's spread it. This is the power distribution block. And the reason I have this tape on here is so I could cover up the parts that I want this metal box to be grounded to, to have a good contact between the box and the frame. The ground is that hole there, the wire goes to it. What I'm doing now is just cutting the existing uh, oven controller housing unit. You guys are all familiar with this if you use a stove. I don't need it this long, so I'm cutting it down and I'm gonna put sides on it. And why make something when I already have it, so it's much easier. For this, I just cut up a little bit of extra steel that was with the stove for the sides. I just generally cut them out with a grinder uh, and then ground it down to the shape of the box afterwards and then just welded it. It's easiest to get that exact shape that way. This metal that I'm welding is pretty thin. It's definitely 20 gauge or less, it's, I don't know, maybe a 32nd of an inch. If you try this with stick or with MIG, you're just gonna end up burning holes in it, so that's why I'm TIG welding it. It's pretty tough stuff. Needs, needs some practice to do this. This is a trick that I like to do if I'm trying to get some straight lines out of a big sheet of metal, like a big long straight cut, because I have to cut it out with the grinder with the cutoff wheel. So I just sandwich it between something that's straight, like a piece of angle iron, and I just grind it flat. All right, it's time to put the hasps, hasps on. That's a weird word. Um, I'm trying to avoid that weld right there because it's, it's kind of hard. Uh, so I'm going on either side of it. And then I drill one hole where it needs to be and then I, I bolt it on and then I line it up so I can drill the second hole. Same with the, the other part of the, the latch. Uh, first hole, 
and then do a rest based on that. I'm using the same technique as I did with the casters. I use a drill bit that's exactly the same size as the hole as what's already pre-drilled and what I'm trying to mount. And then that leaves a nice little divot. It's better than trying to use a center punch because those things, as much as you try, it's never perfect. So nice little divot gets everything in the hole and right in the center every time. Let's get into some electrical issues here. We have an AC, usually like a simple 110 circuit, we got a hot wire and a neutral wire. This applies the power, this just allows the, the power to go back to the box. And then in 220, we have a second 110 wire and these two combine to make 220. There's gonna be a ground wire that is not there yet. And then each one of these wires, you can see, I cut them off, have a tributary that goes off to which will not be connected, uh, the, the burner section for the stove top. And then we have the, this is the normal burner, normal element. Turn the camera a little bit, there we go. So these are for the elements. This is gonna go up to the broiler, and then I gotta move my camera up. Then we have the temperature sensor right here. This is for the neutral, which is going to be eventually connected down below. And this is the bulb. You can see this is the neutral wire everything is going to be connected to eventually. Here's the hot wire for the bulb. Here is one of the things for the burner, and then you saw the other one down below, the orange wire. And then what I have here is there was a switch on the door that would lock the door shut, and they would press this little, this little thing they had a wire coming here, a wire coming here. All it did was just break this, these two wires coming in and just maintained continuity or discontinued it. So I'm just gonna replace this with just a simple switch. And this was used for self-cleaning, for the oven's self-cleaning option. It needs, needs to know that the door is shut, I'm guessing for safety reasons, so it was locked shut during that. And it would know that because this circuit would be on if it was in the locked mode. While I'm waiting for my soldering iron to get hot, you see right here is that switch. And then these are the wires for that. It's shortened considerably. And all it really does is just go boop, off, on, off, on. Just a simple switch, polarity doesn't matter. All right, and then Make sure you put your heat shrink on before you solder, otherwise you got to disconnect it. The box is purple because of the colors available at that moment. I had pink, purple, and teal, and purple was the least objectionable, so I used that. I'm going to do a safety check here. I got my multimeter. I'm going to check continuity between various points here. 
So yeah, I have continuity between these two bolts, which is expected. I just wanted to make sure they had continuity between each other, just in case it didn't. So I should not have continuity between ground and these hot wires. Obviously that's con continuous. Nope, and then I'm gonna check the these here. I'm doing this because what if I mess something up and a hot wire is touching ground somewhere. If I touch it, I could get shocked. So I don't want that to happen. All right, it's insulation time. So I'm going to measure up 25 inches. It's gonna be 24 inches wide, which is gonna get me to, you know, right there. All right, and I went with some fiberglass. There's a lot of controversy about what you should use and what you shouldn't. Fiberglass is supposed to be good up to about a thousand degrees and it'll start to melt. Apparently it won't catch on fire, but it'll possibly melt. And I went with two inches thick because that is what the stove had in it before. So I'm just going to copy it. All right. So I'm going to get the cutting here. Grab it on top of a board down there. And let's have another board. Grab my measuring tape. And then you can use a knife. Hopefully I'm on top of my board there. Here's a lamp. Pretty easy. It is time to put the cover on. I got some galvanized sheet here. As a note, I did rip off the, the foil paper backing. I realized it was really easy to take off, so I took it off. And they're not big enough to fit. So I'm gonna have to do some modifications and it's not gonna be one solid piece. So this is the best I could get. I have the sheet held up with clamps. And I'm going to do the top row here. Start by putting one in first. I have to be careful of the bolts that I've already put in. So try to find a spot. Makes drilling a lot easier. Now I have a drill for an M6 tap. The reason why I like to tap things, that's what she said, um, is because sheet metal screws I don't like. They're a pain in the butt to put in, for starters. You usually you gotta drill a hole anyways, especially through this eighth inch. And then, you know, if you strip them, then nothing holds. Then you can't get them out either. They're just really awful in a lot of ways. I use as much of the original stove as I can to save money. And these little panels I had to just flatten to make them big enough. And then I trimmed off the excess once I had it mounted. But uh, it's free. It's on the top and the bottom. What do I care? I'm not going to see it.
Time to drill the hole for the wires to come through. And right now is the best time because it's easiest to pull them through when I can get access from both sides. A little die grinder helps to uh, get rid of the sharp edges so we don't cut our wires. And I'm sorry that I'm sideways, but that's the only way to get this whole picture in here um, without it being extra teeny tiny. So, yeah, I'm sideways. I know that I've harped about welding and now I'm not welding. Uh, this is because at some point I might want to take this off and welding is really great, but taking it apart, no. Because I wanted the inside to be as big as possible, it's two by two by four. That means the outside has to be bigger than two by two by four. And the only sheets of metal that I could get were two by four. So I had to overlap in some areas. For joining two sheets, this is separate, this is separate. I'm just going to use rivets. I've just been putting them four inches apart at the places that they overlap. Just using a 1 8 drill bit because my fasteners, the rivets are 1 8. Use the appropriate tip in your rivet gun. Slide it in like that. Push it through the hole. Squeeze. Okay, it didn't get it all the way. What it does is it, it pulls this rod out and mushrooms the backside that we can't see. And I'll do it again here. And it's going to snap off just like so. And we'll do it at another four inches. Believe it or not, this goes pretty quickly. Everything else goes very slowly. All right, before I get the back panel on and covered, I currently still have access to all the wires. And I wanna hook this up just to verify everything is okay plug it in, turn it on, let it heat up. If something bad happens, I'll know about it and I can make a change while the wires are still exposed. So, get to doing this. Grab my solder over here. All right. So I'm going to take these wires here. This is one of the thermostat wires or the uh, temperature sensor wire. And oops, I got the wrong one. This one with the blue tape goes to the pink one. I had to extend it with this wire. It was pink. That's what I had. All right. So I'm going to slip on my heat shrink tube before, oops, wrong one. Before I get too far and solder them together, if I don't do that, then I gotta cut it and then resolder it. So what I do, at least with these thin wires, I just twist them together, make sure there's no ends poking out that can cut the heat shrink tube. All right like so and grab my lighter before I get too far here it is all right hopefully my soldering iron is pretty hot I'm going to hold it to the wires and if you think the oven is too hot for wires or for the external coating it can withstand soldering so I'm not sure if I would believe that Soldering is quite hot. So I hold it to the wire to the thing until it gets hot and then solder it. And then flip my heat shrink tube up.
All right, time for the next thermostat wire here. I have this white wire. I don't want to get it confused with the uh, thermostat wire. That is the neutral wire. They're both white, so you gotta be careful. These are quite a bit thinner. These uh, temperature sensor wires. And they're probably DC because running off the board. So I had to pay attention to polarity and that's why I had to make sure that pink wire went to the other thermostat wire. So all I do is just make sure it gets hot. Touch it with some solder. Wait till it cools down a slight amount, otherwise your thermostat or your heat shrink tubing will just contract as soon as you put it over that hot section. See, I've already done this wire, which is, I believe, is for the bulb. All right, and while you're doing this, you kind of want to organize your wires a bit so that when you want to tape them up or organize them, you can a little bit easier without them being in a big knot. All right, so this is a bigger wire. This came out of a project car I'm working on. It's pretty, pretty massive. Definitely bigger than what came on the stove. So it should be good enough for this. Heat shrink tubing gone. slip it over this blue wire I had to extend it it was white now it's blue so you're gonna want to make sure you remember what you did I'll make this a little longer all right and these bigger wires, they're, they're a little harder to uh, join together. You can't just twist time together. So let's get a little creative here. I'll just uh, wrap that one around that one. Make sure it goes through there. All right. All right this is gonna take a little longer to heat up because it's a much bigger wire. Double check to make sure my heat shrink tubing is on there. I always like to hang the heat shrink tubing lower because the heat's probably going to travel up. And this is going to get pretty hot, so it could shrink up here, and then you can't slide it down. You got to cut it apart. So I, I put the soldering iron underneath one side and just wait a really long time until it's hot. This is going to take a little bit. Once the solder can melt on the other side, it's sufficiently hot. Sometimes I add a little bit of solder to the underside. It'll kind of spread into the wires and it'll uh, help with temperature and thermal distribution here. So once it's hot enough, it should melt and then soak up into the wires here. All right, just like that. And wait for it to cool down a little bit. Don't want to try pulling them apart right now because it could because it's soft. Something I can touch it with my hands and not burn myself. It's probably cool. All right, I want to just test it to make sure I can't pull it apart because it falls apart inside the box. That's a big problem. All righty, now I'll slide the heat shrink tubing up and over. All right, I just get a little squeeze at the ends. And now I just gotta do the rest of them. While we watch this riveting action, let's talk about some things that are completely unrelated to everything. Um, you probably notice that I breathe, make weird breathing sounds. Well, I talk and then I have to breathe and I breathe out of my nose because I'm not a mouth breather. I have a deviated septum and then I have allergies now that winter's somewhat over. 
I mean, everything's still dead, but somehow you still get allergies. So my nose is always congested. And then, uh, yeah, I really have no idea why we live in the state of Minnesota. Um, apart from the fact that we're all masochists and we just stay here because this is where we grew up. And if you don't, you're a sissy. So, yeah, I don't get it. Our taxes are high. Our politics stink. We have race riots. I don't know. I don't get it. But here I am. All right, moment of truth. Let's see if this works here. I leave the breaker off because it's easier to turn my welder on than off by the breaker. So I'm going to go turn it on and see what happens. Well, the circuit breaker didn't trip, so that's good. There's the time. Just try bake here. Start. All right, it says preheating. All right. Let's flip the switch, see if anything happens. All right, so it thinks the door is locked, so that's good. All right, clear. Try the broil, broil, start. All right, so nothing bad happened yet. Let's try self-cleaning. Start. All right, so it thinks the door is locked or not locked. Okay, and now, all right, seems all right. Let's try the oven light. Now oh, I gotta turn this off, clear off. There we go, oven light. All right, apparently oven light does not work in self-cleaning mode. Finally. <laughs> Getting to the last steps here. Obviously, I'm not an idiot. This is not plugged in. Don't have it plugged in. And I'm going to hook up the cord. So these two left, left and the right, dang it, are for our hot wires. I'll hook those up first. I cut myself stripping some wires with the razor blade and uh, that's why I have a piece of paper towel because they actually work as a pretty good band-aid. Alright, so the hot wires are connected and because this is a three wire setup, I have my ground wire here is connected to ground and this way if one of these hot wires anywhere in the system were to touch the metal of the box it would follow this pathway back to white and hopefully trip the circuit breaker It was connected with a four wire setup. There we go. All right. right. I made this metal plate to cover it all. That way I don't actually walk past this thing and shock myself touching one of those terminals.
Check the paint. I have panels that I didn't show me installing on camera. Uh, they are there. Your eyes aren't deceiving you. They're just basically access panels for things like the temperature sensor, the upper broiler, and then the bulb. And in case you were wondering, the heating elements stick out of the back and touch insulation. I took it apart when I did the stove. I thought, maybe this burns. I don't know. I think it's hot. But they don't actually get hot until a few inches into the stove, into the oven. So when I had it going, they didn't burn. I definitely think this thing needs a spoiler. Everything needs a spoiler. So that's what I'm doing. So I can go faster. So now I'm going to do a test of the oven, see how long it takes to get up to temperature. Right now I'm going to start at 400 degrees and I'm going to take a temperature of the outside beginning and then once it's at uh, 400 degrees. So you can see I have my thermometer in here. Uh, I didn't show it on camera, but I put some uh, angle iron in a few different locations so I can put something like that across and hang parts from. Okay, so I just turned the oven on. Let's see what the temperature of the outside is. It is 62.4 right now. And the time is, you can see, almost 10 o'clock. It's uh, 10 to 10. All right, it is now, it's upside down for you, but it's now 1030. It is 400 degrees in there, so it definitely takes a while. It took 40 minutes. It's obviously much bigger volume on the inside than the original oven, so I wouldn't uh, expect miracles out of this thing. And let me get my thermometer here. I'm gonna measure the very top. That's probably the hottest part. It is currently uh, 98 degrees on the top, so definitely about a 30 degree change but it's definitely not too hot to the touch. It's like body temperature. So all in all, pretty good.